Hello, everybody. We are now live, and we have Rajneesh with us, who's going to tell us about Raptors for Dummies. So over to Garima, who will tell us about Rajneesh. Hi, everyone. Um, Rajneesh uh, Suvarna has been interested in nature, right, from his childhood. And uh, he has a love for birds uh, that was inculcated by his mother. He's a techie by training. Uh, with a two-decade career in software, and uh, that has uh, enabled him to travel extensively around the world, watching birds on every opportunity. Uh, Rajneesh is the co-author of uh, a book on birds of Delhi, along with Nick. He lived in Delhi for uh, seven years um, and now lives in Bangalore, where he runs an adventure and uh, birding travel company called Wayfarer. Uh, Rajneesh has the keenest eye of any birder that I've known. And those who have birded with him will vouch for his uncanny ability to spot perched raptors from a moving vehicle. So it's very appropriate today that he is going to take us into the world of raptors. Over to you, Rajneesh. Rajneesh, are you there? We can't hear you. Somebody is muting me. Okay, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Garima, for the very flattering introduction. Uh, this uh, talk is finally happening after two postponements. And a lot has happened in between. I lost the presentation. I scrambled in the morning, got it ready today. So luckily for you, it is going to be a much shorter version. So let's start, uh, start with the presentation. I'll just put my video off so that uh, the audio is not uh, hampered. Uh, raptors. Uh, is certainly one of my most favorite group of birds. And for that matter, I think uh, it would be with everybody. So for whenever you are on a birding trip and, and somebody calls out raptor, I'm sure everybody is jolted out of whatever they are doing. And they'll move their binocs and try and find a uh, raptor. Raptors always come on their attention for a lot of reasons. One, they're handsome. That's at least for, from a distance. I'm saying that because even vultures are raptors and you would call them handsome at close quarters. And they're always majestic in flight and so spectacular in the way they come on their head. They always have a regal bearing about them and you can sense a disdain in their eyes as they watch you. They also seem to have an aura of special power and have you in awe with the ability to capture the prey. So, so it's not just surprising that we are in awe of these creatures now, but man in general has been so for a long, long time. Folklore, mythology, and a lot of things in our collective memory are so full of characters which are either raptors or based on raptors. And they have all these attributes like power, heroism, good looks attributed to them. And despite being violent, carnivorous beings, they are more often than not firmly on the side of the good guys. So fortunately or unfortunately, this has also led to humans trying to domesticate them and that is how falconry began and was a hobby, uh, I would say, pun un unintended, unintended for a long, long time. This kind of peak during the medieval times and where you would have a lot of paintings of Mughal princes holding some raptor on his arm. For that matter, even Guru Gobind Singh Ji is always depicted with his chitta vas perched on his arm or flying behind him. However, this art has slowly died out thanks to the new legislation. 
but we still see raptors flying out free. So what exactly are raptors? So these are birds of prey and they are not a formally defined group. Many bird species uh, prey on other animals, both vertebrates and invertebrates. But the term bird of prey is usually applied to daytime or diurnal hunters, excluding the typical nocturnal hunters. Thus, mainly made up of the families Accipitriformis and Falconiformis, and excluding the nocturnal Stegiformis, which means they include kites, eagles, vultures, hawks, falcons, and their allies, while excluding owls. In recent times, with advances in uh, DNA studies and other things, uh, and things have moved away from pure morphology, it has revealed that some families that were included in uh, falcons are not necessarily closely related as we had imagined before. This has resulted in quite a rejig of the taxonomy surrounding them. Condors and the New World vultures uh, have got an order of their own. And while closer home, uh, the falcons, we have realized that the placement of falcons is not closer to any of the other raptors we see, but of all things, parrots. So while this has shown off some of our old concepts regarding raptors, we stick to this group on the basis of their carnivory and hunting adaptations. So why are raptors important? One, they're good looking. Sorry, sorry. If you leave the aesthetic parts out and look at where they are placed in the food chain, it would probably answer that. As it is, you would see they are usually the apex predator. And as an apex predator, uh, how well your bottom rungs are doing depends on how well the apex predator, both in terms of number of species and volumes, is there. So, in a way, birds of prey are important indicators of the health of the environment itself. So we said raptors fascinate us because of the way they behave, of the way they hunt. So what exactly makes them such exciting beings, such exciting uh, hunters? So As we said, they're all uh, daytime hunters. So as expected, you would ex they would be having very good vision, uh, say compared to humans. But to uh, set a benchmark, humans as such also have very good visions, vision if you compare them with other primates or even other creatures for that matter. Uh, but humans have uh, a lot of their uh, receptors uh, concentrated on a certain area on their retina, which means uh, whenever we, we see what is in focus is very clear, but our peripheral vision is always a bit uh, uh, fuzzy. While in raptors, they have a, a higher density of uh, receptors all over their retina, which means they have got a wider canvas and a canvas at a much better resolution. And the advantage is that uh, their flicker fusion frequency is, uh, is quite good. It's much higher than humans, which means that they can uh, process, they have between two, like you could say between two uh, particular images, uh, the separation between two particular images is at a much faster rate. So it gives them a much better judgment of how how, how far the prey is, how fast they're closing in on it, how, how is the obstacle in their flight path. It is more like they are viewing the video in kind of slow motion, just because they have that many frames. To put this in a kind of a camera analogy, we could say that they have got a higher megabit sensor and a higher FPS. Hearing, on the other hand, we would say is 
quite similar to humans, while some raptors uh, probably harriers would have probably better hearing as they are known to uh, listen to critters as they fly low over the grassland. If you see, uh, harriers also have a bit of a face pattern like ours, which help them channelize uh, the sound waves to their ears. But, uh, but as nature is, uh, other species will always take advantages of, of whatever strengths or weaknesses you have. So songbirds, it is seen, have uh, have known, have got to know about this range of uh, hearing that the raptors have, and the alarm calls that they usually do at the sight of a raptor are in a range that are below what raptors can see. So while the poor raptor is flying above, the songbirds can, of course, call at a in a range that is not heard to them, and uh, warn the one other songbirds. When you get the sense of smell, uh, it's quite poorly developed in raptors, while some old world raptors, uh, old world, uh, sorry, new world vultures uh, are known to locate food by, by smell. Uh, it is quite absent in most other raptors. While there have been some studies which have shown that, uh, for example, the Orient Oh, oriental honey buzzard can actually distinguish between different pollen by their smell. But this is all at close quarters. They do not track their prey based on smell. So why these things uh, do help them locate prey, to capture and consume them also, they have quite a few modifications which help them in their lifestyle. For example, they all have pretty strong feet with very well developed talons. And unlike other birds, the rare talon in the raptor is always the biggest. That is usually what pierces and kills the prey. Also, there are other modifications in the feet, like uh, raptors that uh, pick up fish, like osprey and fish eagles, would have slippery, uh, would have rough pads at the base of their feet. And uh, uh, snake eagles would have bare tarsi, which are heavily fortified with thicker uh, scales. And finally, the most identifiable part of the raptor, which is the hook bill. They come in various shapes and sizes, but they always hook, and they, they can rip into flesh or whatever prey they are eating, it, eating into. Uh, while this is migration, we'll just skim this topic as migration is a huge topic and so is raptor migration. I only want to get onto this point as it has some bearing on the ID that it is because it defines on when and where raptors will be found. But one interesting thing I would like to point out that most of the bigger raptors, especially the ones with low wing loading, will as as you can see all the arrows on this map they point to the routes that the raptors take in migration i you see clearly all the thick black ones are always following land routes and always avoid open oceans wherever they have to cross ocean they would go either over islands or keep the crossing as small as possible that is because these raptors the bigger ones like aquila and uh, Vultures, etc., have a, a low uh, low loading wingspan, which means that they don't flap too much. Most of their flying is done by soaring and gliding, which means they use thermals. To use thermals, they need land formations which generate thermals. So that is the reason they follow these paths. But while there are some raptors which have, say, longer, thinner uh, uh, wings and pointed wings, and they flap for the usual, in their usual flight. So these are strong flyers and are usually smaller. And these are known to brave uh, flying across oceans. So a very good example is the Amur falcon, which not only does a very long migration, 
but also does a huge a long uh, uh, cr cross across the ocean going across the indian ocean from the western coast of india to the east coast of africa so do peregrine falcons That will get us to a bit of a background. Raptors, as as fascinating as they are, they are not uh, very easy to ID for a multitude of reasons. One, they could have similar plumages across species. While in in a in a single species, you can have a wide variation in colors, markings. Plus, there's an added uh, twist where they have multiple plumages as they age. So you will always have have them with multi multitude of markings and colors and the way they uh, perch, etc. So if you are just following a system where you where you build the system where you look at ID features uh, on the field guide and match them against a, a a bird in the field, you'd probably get very confused while trying to ID your raptor. So, in this talk, uh, I would not be going into the intricacies of raptor identification, as as that would be quite quite an oversimplification and not really possible given the amount of time that is there. Nor would I be showing you maybe 10 slides with ID features pointed out on them, uh, seeing which you can go out and ID birds, ID raptors in the field. No, that is not happening. So what I'm trying to do is trying to attempt in trying to point out features that you can make a note of and get about to ID raptors in a way that I have been doing it. I'm not claiming in this is the way to ID it or the best way to ID it. It's just that it has worked for me and possibly could work for you. My introduction to birding was quite unconventional in the sense I never had a birding mentor who taught me to ID birds. I used to watch birds because I used to sketch them and I enjoyed watching their behavior. And for, what particular, for whatever reasons, I had been watching and even holding scores of species before I even actually got my first pair of binoculars or even knew about field guides. So, but until, even until that point, I realized that even in the patch that I used to bird or watch birds, even if I got a glimpse of the bird, I was able to uh, know which bird is it. Uh, and in some cases, even know to the level of a particular individual. So, and that is probably how my birding has developed and not just for uh, raptors, I use this uh, for all other birds that I eat. So I follow my system, which I call the three H's and two S's. The three H's I would say are mostly made up of, are made up of habit, habitat and art. So all birds or groups go about a typical way uh, into their routine. So this covers all facets of their life how they hold their wings when they fly, what is the style they fly in, how, how do they hunt, where do they perch, do they sit low, do they sit high, do they, are they hidden or exposed. All these things give, give you a clue to what the species could be. Just to give an example, many Bhutios would always use open perches because their style of uh, hunting is uh, uh, perch and ha perch and watch. While there is another similar group uh, which has the same style of hunting, the exhibitors, 
but they will always tend to sit within a canopy. So while their style of hunting is the same, it is probably defined where the perch is probably defined by their habitat, which is what we next we come to next. So all 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 species and raptors in particular uh, are slaves to their habitat. So there are very few species that can actually flourish in multiple habitats. And being on top of the food chain means that it's even more true for raptors. So fish eagles are always found close to water bodies, water harriers would be around grasslands. And even if you see, in, even in a particular genus, you would have uh, species picking up different habitat. For example, in Tlanga, if the greater spotted eagle would often be close to water, which might not be the case for the Indian spotted eagle. And that gets us to the third edge, which is the R. So, like a, the reason I touched about migration is because a lot of uh, raptors in India are migrants. They could be either long distance migrants or, in some cases, even local migrants or local migrants. So, depending on what time of the year you are burning, you would have to contend with a with a with a lesser number of species. Uh, that, that are there. For that matter, even the time of the day you're birding has a bearing on what species you're likely to see. As an example, harriers or falcons are early risers, while larger eagles and vultures take to the sky much later. This gets us to the two S's, which are size. Size is always a good indication to slot your sighting into a particular family or group. While, while you can, while it's it's quite a uh, what do you say, a prominent feature, it is sometimes difficult to judge it if the bird is at a distance or there is nothing to benchmark the bird against. You also need to keep a note that when you're looking at size, uh, you should remember that uh, raptors show uh, reverse sexual dimorphism, which means that the females are always bigger than the males. And in some species, they'll be substantially so. And this is especially uh, to be kept in mind when you there are certain species which you differentiate based on their size. Just to give an example, you would say between a Eurasian sparrowhawk and a northern goshawk. So a, a female Eurasian uh, sparrowhawk would be quite large and sometimes equal to or bigger than a male northern goshawk, which otherwise is a much bigger bird on average. And finally we get to the shape. Between shape and size, you define what is called as the structure. I know a lot of birders will roll their eyes when they hear the word structure or jizz. But I can assure you it's not some mythical property. And in my experience, it's the strongest of all pointers. But unfortunately, uh, for uh, mainly for beginner birders, it is not something that you can compare against an illustration in a field guide and get an answer. It has got a lot to do with subtle variations and variations across species that you only notice after watching birds continuously in the field. I say field because however good a photograph it is, it is always a 2D imprint and that can't really capture the essence of the bird. So in the field, it is always important to know exactly what to watch out for. As often, the bird might not give you enough time for a detailed inspection. So we basically divide how we go about it into how we look at birds that are perched and birds that are in flight. Uh, raptors have heightened senses and 
an intrinsic shy nature, which means more often than not, if you see them first, they're always far away. And it's kind of putting in another degree of difficulty to crack the ID. So first thing when you see a perched bird is you look at the proportions. As you said, uh, sizes. First of all, you judge the size, then you look at its stance. You see if it is, if the stance is erect, horizontal, is it hunched? Does it look bulky? How is the, what is the size of the head in comparison to the body? What is the length of the tail? Well, you can see here, for example, here are two very similar looking birds. While the upper one has a much, while they look pretty similar in all other features if you look at, but if you just think of the outline, you would see this is a much a heavier bird, much sturdier. It has got broader shoulders, a deeper chest, compared to the tawny, which is similar but a more comparatively slender bird. Similarly here, you look at this bird, you see it's, it's got a comparatively small head and a big bulky body and a typical shape. A shape, even if it is bulky, they all have different shapes. Uh, that just gives, gives me an idea. Can anybody guess what this bird is in the, in the silhouette? Maybe you can chat, put your answers in the chat. Anybody trying? Okay, that's good. I see a lot of them have got the right answer. Yes, it's the CAC. It's even though it's bulky like, like the bird we saw in this, it's got a very typical shape with a shorter neck and a bigger head. So while it is bulky, the the shape does matter. Similarly, the other bird here is more slender, has got a very upright stance and has got a very obvious crest. While the head gives you a lot of clues, uh, it's, it's quite, it's not very often that you can easily see them in the field uh, while it is perched. Main thing you need to see is the size of the head, the shape of the head. Is it, is it rakish, angular like the step eagle, or rounded like the buzzard? How is the bill heavy? Is it heavy? Is it big? This, is, this, this, this has a big heavy bill. But then you compare it to a fish eagle, which has got a, a longer and much heavier bill. And then you'd see a, a vulture, which has got an even heavier bill. While the hawk eagles have a smaller, but while you compare the falcon and the uh, common buzzard, you can see both have got comparatively smaller bills. While the falcon has a more prominent bill, it's uh, head shape is different from the buzzard. While even among the buzzards, uh, you, you can differentiate between the common and the long legged buzzards, which are very confusing based on the shy, shape of the heads and the shape of the bill. So the shape of the head is always quite important. Similarly, how protruding the bro is. This has got a very heavy bro. Even this has one, but it is not all that heavy. So these are the features you would need to see in the head. Another important parts are the legs. Uh, uh, are they booted? Do, are they uh, how? Are they feathered? How long are they? How thick? 
how th thick are the tarsi? If the tarsi are feathered, how, how much of the uh, tarsi is covered with, with feathers? Anybody here can guess what these four birds are? Similarly, okay, couple of right answers, but I will tell you what you need to look for this. For example, in this, you need to look for the feathering on the tar side. So this obviously is an Akila. So this, I think, is a, it's an Akila, it's most probably a Tawny Egan. Here we have got thick tar side with, which are bare and they're with heavily fortified scales, which is very typical of the snake eagle. So this, this is, uh, these are the legs of a short coat snake eagle. These are the long legs of a common buzzard. Well, you can see most of the tarsi are bare. And this is another, this is another buzzard, which has got longer tarsi. And the amount of feathering the, uh, that is covered is also different from the common buzzard. This is quite a good feature to look at because by plumage, they are often confusing. And this is something all of us is a quite well-known example. And probably while there are different ID features that you can see in this bird, the most dramatic is the thickness of the legs. So this is of course the Besra. And you can see the very thin legs that it has compared to a Shikra. Well, there is also another ID feature. I'm not looking at the tail bands because we can't see the tail bands here. But you can see the length of the primary, the primary extension that is there. So you can see it is much shorter in the Besra, while it is pretty long in the Shikra. So we'll come to this later when we look at predators in uh, raptors in flight. Another thing is tail tip wing tip ratio. Uh, it, they're certainly more important in some species than others. Here you can see them in two harriers and in the fishing eagles. So that gets us to raptors in flight. So this is how you mostly see raptor. They are in flight, sometimes they are fast, sometimes they are slow, but I would say most of the time you would uh, aspire raptor this way. While I would say that is a good thing in one thing, in one way because raptors are much easier to identify in flight than when they are perched. And while they can be raptors, though distinctive, can be quite similar to where some uh, other species do look like. Like, for example, you could confuse them with some kapu or a pigeon or a stork. But most uh, uh, birders who are not beginners can uh, identify raptors by, the, by their flight and their uh, pattern. Of course, a lot of beginner birders look only at size to define, to look, uh, to identify a raptor in flight. So what do we look for uh, a raptor in flight? Here too we look at the general proportion of the bird. Uh, though it's very difficult to judge size, size especially if they are far, you can 
get a relative size of the head to the wings and to the tail and how these uh, correlate to each other. For example, here, even though you can uh, sound, you can make out that this is a smaller bird as compared to this. How do, we, how do you figure this out? This is because we are paying attention to the relative size of the body parts, the size of the head to size of the wings, which, which tells, our, tells our brain that this is a much larger bird. So even if we don't, uh, even if they're not very close, just based on their structure, you can have a good uh, uh, idea about what size this bird is. So apart from, in proportion, what do we look for? So we look for the head. So in head, in flight, they're probably fast and moving. So you probably won't see too many details of the head, but you would able to, able, you, you can, you'd be able to see the shape of the head. Is it, is it big, is it thick set? And probably get a judge, judgment of the bill, which is also quite important. That gets us to the wing. This is probably the easiest part to see when it is flying. And it is quite distinct, distinctive across different species. So, so this is al always a, a very good pointer to what group or species you're looking at. So here you see the first bird, it's, it's got a narrow, long wing which is pointed. The wing is quite, you would say, triangular and long, which is very typical of falcons, which fly fast and in open country. So these are the kind of wings they have. So this would immediately point you to a falcon. So this is, you can see, a large bird. It's got a, a, rec, a very rectangular uh, looking wing with very uh, long and separated fingers. Both, both the edges of the wing seem to be parallel to each other and would be different from this wing, which is maybe a bit chunky. It is broad, but it is not very long. And it has some slight curve on the rear edge. It has fingers that are separated, but not as deep as this. So this is an Aquila and this is a buzzard. Butio. Well, here you have another one with a very, with a very, with very bulging secondaries, a rounded wing, a short wing, not very large, and you can say this is also the, this is also quite similar to that, but you would see that this has got what you say longer and fingers that are more separated, while the bulging. Secondaries are not characteristic of, of this family. I, actually, it's actually an ID feature to separate this bird from the rest uh, in its genus. So this is an accipiter on the top, which, which has rounded wings. Uh, and this is a hawk eagle, uh, which also has rounded wings, but not as rounded as the accipital. Rounded wings actually are a pointer that these are forest birds and would be flying among vegetation. So, so in accipitas, uh, how much, uh, how rounded are the wings are also an indication to differentiate between the species. So this is a, a crested goshawk and which, which is the reason it has this very bulging secondaries pinched at the bottom. But if you uh, look at the shikra, which is, which is also an accipiter, but favors more open country than maybe say a crested goshawk or a besra. And like I showed you in the earlier slide, uh, the shikra had much, uh, much longer primary projection, which actually uh, translates to a more pointy wing here. 
as against a Vesera, which should have a rounded ring. So those are ID features that you can use to differentiate between hack separators. This is a very different looking and very unique ring shape. This is a black baza and probably not many confusion species to go with it. Apart from the ring shape, how exactly they hold their rings also is a very good pointer to what species they are. While most uh, Puteos uh, would, have a, would have a kind of a diadral uh, flight, that is means that their wings are slightly upturned. When they are upturned, they are not bent at their wings. If you could see all these wings are straight and they're never bent at their wings. So a butio, most of the butios would have share a very shallow V, while a long leg buzzard has a very shallow V. So one you can uh, differentiate butios by their V, but you can also separate out the long, long leg by the very shallow V. Similarly, the hyrials also hold their wings very straight and in a shallow V. While the booted eagle will hold the wings very straight, but the fingers would be upturned. While a, while a white-eyed buzzard, if you see head-on, has a very straight profile, very straight profile. While some, some of the raptors angle their wings. Angle their wings, when you say angle wings, they're angled here at their wrist. So, in this case, for example, for a black-shouldered kite, it looks like the wings are in a straight line and the body is hanging from it. Or it looks like it's like a spider uh, in the case of an osprey. An osprey uh, also has a very typical flight, uh, as, uh, as somebody really mentioned in a birding trip. It looks like somebody who has got rheumatism. One, it's got this very angled looking thing. And even when it flies, it has got a very stiff kind of flight. Like, looks like somebody's struggling with uh, rheumatism. Then we have got this flat, but where the hands are dropped. So this is very typical of Achilles and clangers. So your step eagle, a tawny eagle, and the spotted eagles will all show this kind of a profile. And then there are the ones which are bored, which means you don't have this angle uh, that you see there. It's kind of curved and your body is the highest part. And then the wings sweep down and they turn up at the tips. So this is very typical of uh, the chips, the old world uh, vultures. And uh, very obvious due to the size in peregrine and sacred. While, while it not be very obvious in the gyps given, given the size of the bird that is there. Then we get to the tail. Tails are quite distinctive. You have the wedge or diamond shape as in the Lamagaya or in the Egyptian eagle. A, a rounded tail like quite a few raptors, squared triangular in the boot tail, spoked in the kite. So a ta the tail shape along with the V shape are a very good indicator of what they are. Also, la as with the tail, uh, uh, with the shape of the tail, the length of the tail is also very important. So you need, when you see the shape of the tail, you also need to make a note of the length of the tail because in quite a few groups of the birds where the shape of the tail is the same, the length of the tail often defines which species it is. So now that you have noted all this, this is when you probably put the whole thing together. <coughs> so so as we, as you discuss the shape of the accipital, they're small. Uh, narrow with narrow long tail and uh, forest dwelling birds that have this very typical profile. You see this uh, a shortish uh, wing with a rounded uh, tip and a long tail and they have a fast uh, rapid motion. So they will uh, do flap, flap, flap and then they'll glide. 
again flap 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 glide this is very typical of the way accipitals fly uh, something that would be uh, uh, similar in shape would be uh, the hawk eagles but they have much shorter tails and much more bulging uh, secondaries uh, on them then we have uh, falcons which are slender pointy wing with a fan uh, a fan shaped tails so these slender wings point to open country and and these being speedsters that is why peregrine is the fastest creature on earth these also fly these fly with steady wing flaps unlike the shikra which does flap 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 and glide uh, falcon would uh, uh flap continuously and steadily then you have butios uh, the buzzards that you see here which are large you can see the broad wings and the short tail compared to the ones we have seen earlier and you can see that even the body is somewhat chunky and the the wings are kind of uh, and the wing uh, wing beats are like slow and very labored and these birds don't fly very often they fly for some time and then they perch for longer time so they have a habit uh, of sitting and watching watching out for the prey from a exposed perch bazas are very typical paddle shaped things for example the jordan baza here or the black baza here different kinds of paddle but the shape is very very distinctive you can't miss out the jordan baza if you are looking at shape if you and and this is a, a very good example where if you go looking at the plumage you probably get confused with three four different species then this gets us to to the big eagles and vultures now all of these are like big you can say big because you can see the shape of the head and the long rectangular wings which are broad but they all broad in different ways also see the uh, length of the tail also varies also also you can see how different their fingers are they all deeply fingered but they are still different in the in how long the fingers are while the black eagle also has long rectangular uh, wings with uh, well spread out fingers you you would see it has a very long tail and a very distinctive wide arm similarly a kite is easily judged by its tail but often in molt you see that the tails are not really forked and they could be triangular but the wing shape is very typical it is long rectangular with fingers similarly i don't have harriers put up here but harriers have uh, like i said a very distinctive uh, diagonal flight where they fly very low low over the ground in a very slow flight so so hiding raptors like most birds is not about one id feature that you have it is always about a collection of features so which is the reason i went through all these points so that you need to note what exactly you need to see in the field and it is not necessary that you make your id in the field in an instant don't be in a hurry always make sure you are Uh, noting down all the features that you would need to arrive at an id you can arrive at an id later that is not a problem and it is always possible that even after all this effort you would probably still get food but that also is not a problem raptors always are difficult and even experts of food all the time so that's how 
I go about birding raptors. I hope I I hope you guys found it useful. And I would. Thank you, Rajneesh, for that really interesting talk. Uh, maybe we can go ahead with the I think question. I think I've lost my audio. We can hear you, Rajneesh. Okay, I, okay, 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 fine, yeah. I hope I was audible till the end. Uh, yes, you were. Uh, do you yeah. want to go ahead with the question no, first? Yeah, yes, please. Open yeah. up the chat in the meantime for people to ask any questions that they have. So we've opened up the chat. Uh, in case you have any questions for Rajneesh, you can type them out and uh, I'll read them out to Rajneesh and he can answer them for you. Rajneesh, while the questions come in, do you want to go ahead with the Zai's question in the meantime? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, here's a quiz question, uh, and there are prizes for this, courtesy Zeiss. So please look at the silhouette and send the ID uh, to the URL that is given there. And you have got some exciting prizes for that. You have got a binocular harness and the Zeiss cleaning kit. And it's quite a simple question. I hope most of you get it. Right. You need to, you, while you send the ID, you also need to give why you think it is that part. Just giving the ID is not sufficient. As it is a very simple question. Great. So, uh, Rajneesh, we have our questions flowing in. Uh, the first one we've got is from Deepak, who's asking, what is the difference between old world and new world vultures? Uh, New World refers to the Americas, so the vultures that you see there, the turkey buzzard, the condors, etc. are called the New World vultures, while the Old World are of course the gyps and the aerogyps and all the other ones, which we see uh, in Europe and Asia. And the New World vultures, as I mentioned during the talk, are now uh, they have figured out that they are pro probably closer to stocks than they are to other raptors. Great. Uh, another question we've got from Puneet is, how far do raptors roost from their feeding sites? Raptors can actually fly great distances. So, it, 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 and it could vary greatly across uh, uh, species. For example, harriers could maybe go tens of kilometers from where they roost. Where they roost communally. For I'm giving an uh, example of harriers because they roost communally. While some birds might not uh, go a great distance. A good example is the spotted eagle, which is often sighted uh, roosting close to the place where it hunts the whole day. S similarly with species like peregrine falcon. So it's quite variable across species and is more dependent on their habit. Okay. Uh, another interesting question. Uh, Abhijit is asking, what does booted mean? So I presume his question is around why is a booted eagle is called so. A booted refers to the boots which are the feathering on the tarsi. So all Akilas have it. And this is one of the reasons why Hegetus has been put into Aquila. So all, actually all, this, all the Aquilas have boots. So Step Eagle, Tawny Eagles, all have those feathers on their legs, which are boots. Okay, another couple of questions coming in. Uh, I'm just going to club the questions. One's from Akash and one's from uh, Dr. Krishendra Singh. Uh, so the first one is how important is bird plumage for ID and the second is how useful can be the voice uh, like can voice be a helpful ID feature as well. 
Okay, I'll go with plumage. Uh, the reason I have not put uh, so much emphasis on plumage in this presentation is for the simple reason. I think especially for raptors, plumage is not a great way to start your ID. It is probably the, a good way to end your ID with plumage, but you need to get to your uh, uh, key of suspects without looking at plumage. And what, what are the other part? I, sorry, I missed it. Other one was around how useful can voice, basically a song or a call of the bird be to ID uh, raptors. Yeah. yeah, if you can hear it, uh, it's probably very useful, but uh, most of the raptors don't call so often. And so the few ones that call uh, CSE, CHE, uh, or the kites, you know, they are, the calls are pretty distinctive. But for the most part, other raptors, you will hardly hear them call. So it is not much of a help, because on, only because you don't hear them so often. Great. Uh, Harish is asking, what are the migrant raptors in peninsular India? So if you could just tell a few of the migrant raptors. I think most of the migrant raptors get into some some part of the peninsula. So I think just barring a, a, a very few that uh, only go up to Gujarat, say for example, just to think of that from the top of my head, maybe the Merlin or maybe the Imperial Eagle, which does come into some part of the peninsula. I think most migrating raptors do come into some part of the peninsula. Okay. A lot of viewers are asking this question right now. Would you, which books or field guides would you recommend for actors? Uh, there would be a lot of books that you can refer to. There are a lot of good books, but like I said in the presentation, there are you would not be using them as field guides. So, of course, there is a really good book by uh, Rishad for Indian Raptors. And then there is the uh, Raptors of the World by Fossman, which is, which is, I think, one of the final words on Raptors. But then you need to glean uh, information from different field, book, field guides also. So, but these two books, I would say, uh, what you would need to refer to first. Okay. Uh, so Deshna is asking, what is the reason for morphological variations in same species? Even birds of the same age sometimes look different from each other. Yes, that is what makes raptors so unique. There is so much variation in the plumage. I don't know what causes them. <laughs> I don't know if, if it is really known what causes them. But I certainly don't know what causes them. Okay. Um, Kiran is asking, in your birding forays in India, have you ever come across what you would call raptor hotspots? And if so, could you please tell us uh, about a few such hotspots? Yeah, of course, there are a few places which are raptor hotspots. Uh, a lot of grasslands in southern India, uh, places in Rajasthan which are quite known in Bikaner and Jaisalmer. And the sub-Himalayas, uh, I think uh, just before or after migration is a great are great places to see raptors. Though people don't think of it that way, I think you see the most raptors in the Himalayas. But of course, if you want to photograph them, probably Rajasthan or all these grasslands in peninsular India would be a better bet. Okay. Uh, another question we have uh, is that do all raptors have territories and home ranges? Yes, uh, generally, yes, they do, yeah. While there are some raptors, uh, which at least uh, won't, it won't hold so in the wintering months, but in general, you can say they do have uh, territories both in their wintering as well as summer months. Okay. Um, this one's a little specific to ID features. Uh, I mean, you can choose to answer it. Like, it's any helpful tips to differentiate between a Himalayan and a common buzzard in the field? Very difficult, very subtle. I think geographical 
delimitation is probably the best way to go about it, unless you have enough experience looking at those words. Okay, uh, maybe let's just take the last couple of questions for uh, the day. Uh, I'm clubbing a couple of questions of vultures here. Uh, Mahendra Singh is asking, how do we differentiate or identify male or female in vultures? And uh, Sharath is asking, what is your take on establishing vulture restaurants in India? Uh, you, at least I am not able to differentiate between male or female vultures in the normal in a normal in a normal sighting and regarding establishing vulture restaurants given the state of uh, the vultures that are there i i am not uh, what do you say uh, opposed to the idea i would say it pro pro probably a good way to get their numbers up to a certain level Great. I think Rajneesh will close with that. Thank you so much for a very informative talk. Uh, it's, it means it's something that's going to really help us improve our ID skills of Raptors. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, please join us uh, today again at 5 p.m. where we have a very interesting talk by Carol Linskip, uh, where she talks about her journey from England to India overland and, uh, her, and talks about her birding in India in, in the late 70s and early 80s. So uh, hopefully see you all there. Thank you very much.